Welcome to PCM Bite Size, a series of short, informative video casts with experts in their field. The theme for today's session is the world in 2020, payments in Europe and Eurasia. Each year, PCM researchers undertake primary research across 33 countries in Europe and 10 countries in Eurasia. These reports give a market-leading and comprehensive picture of the digital and card payment ecosystems, as well as the hard data and statistics to back up that narrative. I'd like to introduce our expert for the day, Victoria Conroy. Vicky is the lead researcher and editor of PCM's digital and card payment yearbooks. Vicky, welcome. Thank you, Alex. So let's just jump straight into it. And we can't really avoid talking about COVID. So uh, this year's yearbook include data from 2020, which shows just how much COVID-19 has affected the consumer payment habits and how it's affected in a very short space of time. What are the kind of emerging trends, you know, at a very high level, who would you say the winners and the losers are from, uh, from the last year's data? Well, it's no secret that banks, payment networks and governments have been working to drive down cash transactions in favour of non-cash electronic payments for lots of reasons like greater security and more convenience. And since the advent of contactless payments around 15 years ago now, a lot of progress has been made in persuading consumers about the benefits of contactless. And if you look at the UK, for example, last year uh, in 2019, the number of contactless transactions rose by 16% to reach 8.6 billion payments in total. And at the end of 2019, there were 132 million contactless cards in circulation with 85% of debit cards and 74% of credit cards in the UK having contactless functionality. In mid-2020, research showed that a third of UK adults were already avoiding using cash because of the risk of COVID, and contactless on online payments now outstripping the use of banknotes and coins. Uh, if we look at Italy, uh, the number of contactless car payments was less than 3% of the total car payments in 2014 and was estimated to be 30% of all car payments at the end of 2019. Data showed that in 2019, contactless payments rose from 40.5 40 billion in 2018 to 63 billion in 2019, which is a rise of 56%. Uh, looking at Poland, that's in the group of countries with the highest level of contactless cards use in the world. Um, in 2019, the number of payment cards with a contactless function uh, reached 37.1 million, which represented a 1.1 million rise on the mid-2019 figures. Currently, contactless cards constitute nearly 86.7% of all payment cards in Poland. But there are still lots of people who are worried about using contactless, who are confused about how it works, who still prefer to use cash for all sorts of reasons. But what nobody anticipated was this global pandemic and just how much that would impact how people make low value payments in such a fundamental way. Uh, just the simple act of handing over banknotes and coins in a shop is now affected by the risk of catching COVID-19. Um, nobody wants to be touching a pin pad in a busy shop or train station and so on and risk catching COVID. So this is where contactless really demonstrates its benefits. There's no contact, no risk. It makes for speed and secure transactions through your bank card or phone. It's much safer for consumers and for merchants who don't want to be handling cash, banknotes, coins, and so on. Uh, and the payment networks and banks really took quick action to encourage more contactless transactions. In March of 2020, contactless limits were doubled in several countries around the world, as is detailed in the yearbooks. And this has helped consumers to make a wider range of contactless payments in many more places. And although the yearbooks don't have complete data for 2020, you can see in several country profiles that we've been able to include data from March to June 2020, showing just how rapidly the pandemic has impacted low value payments. And 2020 may very well be the, may very well be the year that the world was converted to contactless. So according to European Central Bank, looking at non-cash payments overall, 
In the euro area, non-cash payments increased by 8.1% to 98 billion in, 2000, in 2019 compared with the previous year for a total value of 162.1 trillion euros. Car payments accounted for 48% of that total. And the figures for 2020 are likely to be far higher if the PCM yearbook data is anything to go by. As of mid-2020, um, if we look at Russia, contactless in-store transactions were already above 53% in Russia compared to 45% in 2019. Some 36% of Russians made contactless payments with smartphones compared to 13% in the year before. And this is largely due to the impact of COVID-19. If you look at Ukraine, for example, the share of non-cash payments there between January and June 2020 increased to 55.1%. And in other countries in the Eastern, Eastern European region, in Serbia, for example, card-based e-commerce purchases in the second quarter of 2020, the number of transactions shot up by 105.59% compared to the same quarter in 2019. The value of these transactions rose by 77.9% compared to the second quarter of 2019. And even if we look at established mature markets in Western Europe, COVID-19 will drive more, pay more payments away from cash for sure. Um, in Germany in 2020, 50% of all payments on gyro card cards were made, made in 2020, which were contactless. In addition, Contactless credit cards, contactless credit card payments made in 2020 amounted to around 70% of the total credit card payments by number. So overall, if you're looking at the big winners to come out of uh, this year's yearbook data, it's definitely uh, the payment players which are pushing contactless and um, safe, secure payments at the POS which is really starting to take a bite out of low value cash payments across the whole of Europe. It's, um, it's pretty amazing that, isn't it? Absolutely sensational figures in terms of the, the, the rise and rise of contactless. And I note um, as well today that I saw something that uh, up to 30% of uh, merchants in the UK now are actually barring people from using from using cash, you know, and it wasn't so long ago that you used to walk into shops and people had the sign saying cash only, no cards. And now we're seeing the same sign back to front, no, no, uh, no cash card only. So fascinating yeah. stuff, fascinating stuff. Um, okay, let's move on to, uh, to instant payments. I mean, this year's edition is the first to kind of fully map the impact from the launch of instant payments across Europe. And uh, it's pretty clear from, from what you and I have discussed and what we can see from the, uh, from the yearbooks, the real-time payments are already transforming consumer payment habits. Uh, and by extension, uh, bank and payment provider strategies. You know, how, how are you seeing this being borne out in the market? Well, by now, you're familiar with card link, mobile payments and mobile-based money transfers. Um, and the missing link really was instant immediate, immediate settlement of those payments. Um, with the likes of Apple and Google and Samsung now encroaching on consumer payment habits and methods, uh, banks have been left in no doubt that they really needed to step up their game and offer customers speed, security and convenience with instant credit transfers that consumers can send from their mobile phones. Uh, in many markets, the astonishing pace of adoption by consumers means that instant payments have become the new normal in many markets. Um, if you look at established developed payment markets like the Netherlands, where more than 200 million instant payments were processed in 2019 alone, instant payments have now become the new standard for credit transfers, with over 95% of Dutch consumers now able to initiate and receive instant payments through their bank. Uh, and the yearbooks show how the intersection of mobile payments with instant credit transfers could be the tipping point for developed and emerging payment markets alike. By 2019, the, Swish, uh, the Swedish mobile payment service Swish reported that 7.5 million Swedes were using that service and there are an estimated 
529 million Swiss payments that year, up by a staggering 91% over 2018. Mm. Uh, if you look towards Eastern Europe, um, the Baltic states have always had a reputation for being fast adopters of electronic payment services. And in Latvia in 2019, 9% of all credit transfers were settled in real time. Over 16.1 million instant payments worth around 3.5 billion euros were made in Latvia, representing growth of 191% in volume and 201% in value over 2018. Over 90% of bank customers now in Latvia have access to instant payments. If you look at Russia, uh, instant payments were launched there in the middle of 2019 and there's been rapid initial uptake with over 730,000 transactions worth 6.5 billion rubles processed in the first month of operation alone. And by the end of 2019, over 6.8 million instant payments worth 59.7 billion rubles were made, with the number of transfers 67 times greater in the fourth quarter of 2019 compared with the first quarter. And the volume of transfers was 75 times greater, which indicates the widespread use and convenience of making instant payments via mobile devices. Um, overall, in just, um, just over two years, um, 56 countries now have rolled out instant payments and we're seeing mm. rapid consolidation in the back-end processing systems for these instant payments as well. Uh, the latest example <clears throat> was just in October 2020, when the Pan Nordic P27 initiative took a major step forward in establishing its clearing infrastructure when it signed an agreement to acquire Sweden's clearing house for mass payments. Uh, Sweden's clearing house, Bank Giro, handles transactions worth around 73 billion kroner every day. And for cross border instant payments, it could be the case that. The P27 platform sets the template for how to create a pan-regional interoperable clearing platform. Amazing. Again, um, just some incredible stats. And I guess that's not solely driven by the by the pandemic. I guess that's just the the the, the weight of the real-time platform starting to starting to bite into you know the consumer love of mobile and 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 the understanding of their ability to be able to to use those instant payments. That's that's uh, that's great. Thank you. So, um, you know, that's the kind of new school. Uh, let's discuss the old school. Debit cards continue to be the most popular payment uh, card for European consumers. Uh, what's helping to drive up card payments or at least um, maintain the steady pace of, uh, of debit card payments across the region? Well, of nearly 87 billion payments in 2019, cards have become the most widely used cashless payment instrument in the EU27 and UK countries. Uh, in the period from 2000 to 2019, card payments consider considerably outperformed direct debits and credit transfers by number and with a growth rate of more than 10% compared to approximately 5% for credit, transfer, credit transfers and direct debits. Um, Notably as well, the number of payments with debit cards increasingly exceeds the number of payments with credit cards and delayed debit cards. And this general trend can be observed throughout the EU27 and UK countries. Uh, however, the starting, the starting point differs greatly from country to country owing to diverging national market infrastructures, payment behaviours and customer preference. Historically, debit cards were just used for cash withdrawals and POS payments, but with the with the advent of online commerce, uh, international debit cards are enabled for online payments and online shops. Um, thanks to that, and thanks to the advent of digital innovation, card holders in Europe are now capable of making debit card payments for purchases at POS terminals in physical merchant outlets for online shops, in mobile shops, for mobile e-commerce, uh, for contactless mobile, NFC, in-store and car payments in-app as well. Uh, additionally, card holders can also connect their cards with digital payment services such as Apple Pay, Google Pay, Samsung Pay and so on. 
or they could connect their cards with virtual accounts of online payment service providers such as PayPal or Amazon Pay. Um, although the number of cards in Europe is growing at a rate you'd expect in a mature market at around 3%, card payments themselves are showing a strong increase of nearly 12% over 2018, helped by the rapid increases in e-commerce payments, cross-border payments and the uptake of contactless for low-value payments. And Europe's always been a debit-heavy market, but payments on credit and de delayed debit cards are registering a notable compound annual growth rate of 6.5% between 2015 and 2019, and that's compared with 1.8% growth in card numbers overall. And what's helping really is wider acceptance across a, a larger number of attended and unattended merchants which is helping to boost the number of car payments across the whole region. And for that, you need more POS terminals. And the yearbooks show that the number of POS terminals in Europe grew by 8% to reach 19.45 million at the end of 2019, and growing by 51.7% in the last five years overall. Um, at the end of 2019, there were more, more than 85% of total POS terminal base was contactless enabled, while mobile POS terminals are helping small businesses across the region to accept card and mobile payments, whereas before they were only capable of, of taking cash payments. Um, looking at the yearbook data, the total of POS payments by number for all of the E33 countries covered in the yearbook show an overall growth rate of 12.4% in 2019. And for 2020, we can expect that figure to rise even further, partly due to the pandemic, but also due to consumers really getting to grips with mobile payments, digital wallets and other payment form factors, which are helping to drive down cash usage across the whole region. It's very interesting, again, just, um, you know, hearing those stats around POS, uh, growth, you know, for all of those people in the market that are saying that the uh, terminal terminal manufacturers and uh, POS providers are, are, are on their way out because the, the the business is dying. Very interesting to hear that actually it's uh, it's still growing and, and indeed is quite vibrant with the addition of soft POS coming into the market and some of the MPOS terminals you referenced there. So so there's uh, there's life in that old dog yet for those that are still in there. Um, Okay, let's um let's move away slightly from the from the payment side and maybe into more of the authentication side and, and, and fraud. Um, you know, there was there have been a lot of trials and, and and unfortunately many of them not as successful as they could have been uh, of biometric ID. But now we see biometrics as becoming firmly established around this payment authentication and anti fraud. You know, from the research, what, what what's emerged? Uh, as the sort of greatest opportunities um, for for uh, biometrics and fraud prevention? Well, what biometrics has really done is removed all of the friction from the customer acquisition and onboarding process. It's really time consuming and cumbersome to go through the traditional onboarding process with a bank. You, know, you have to find your ID documents and so on, scan them, email them, upload them. Uh, and once you become a customer, then you have to set your login details, try to remember them every time you log in, uh, which is a pain. And especially if you have accounts or products across different banks, there are a lot of passwords and logins that you have to keep track of. What biometric, <coughs> excuse me, what biometric authentication is helping banks and payment players to do is really speed up that onboarding process and to cross sell new payment services with new layers of security at a much faster rate than they were able to do with previous authentication methods. Um, once a customer has registered and verified their data, they no longer need to upload ID documents every time they want to open a new account or product. They don't need to manually enter logins or passwords, and banks can cut down on the administration and processing time in onboarding the customer. And biometrics are not just securing payment transactions, but also transforming the customer service experience in profitable and positive ways. If you look at Estonia, which is recognised as one of the most digitally advanced societies in the world, 
49% of smartphone owners in Estonia use biometric identification for banking and payments. And the take up of biometrics has undoubtedly been driven by government mandated electronic ID initiatives like the Smart ID app. This app allows access to electronic services, including government and banking services, and it eliminates the need to store passwords and codes. Currently around 35% of the Estonian population uses Smart ID, and that's led to banks like Swedbank and others to cease issuance of code cards in favour of Smart ID. So we can already see the, um, the positive impact that these new frictionless biometric methods are, are enabling banks to, um, to achieve. Um, if you look at Russia, uh, the unified biometric system platform, which was developed at the request of the Bank of Russia, the central bank there, combines voice and facial recognition based on photographic images, and it provides a precise identification of a person. Customers can then open accounts, apply for loans, move funds, and conduct other financial transactions remotely from smartphone, tablet, or desktop computer after biometric authentication using the device's cameras and microphones. Um, Sparebank of Russia, their ID platform supports voice, face and retina biometrics. And in 2019, Sparebank ID became a single authentication system for secure sign-in to online services offered by Sparebank, giving customers access to over 40 services using that method. Currently, around 6 million clients use Spearbank ID. Um, if you turn to Ukraine, uh, the biometric mobile payment solution FacePay24 is in use there, allowing cardholders to, to take selfies and attach their bank card image to make payments via a mobile phone app. This solution integrates technologies from Visa, Amazon Web Services, and the updated private bank mobile app Private24. Using the app, the card holder takes three selfies and attaches their Visa bank card image to make payments. Elsewhere in Europe, contactless biometric facial recognition payments have been launched in Romania, enabling any customer to complete a transaction without using a phone card or cash. Customers can sign up for the service regardless of the mobile phone model they use or what bank issued their payment card. And they can download the Pay by Face consumer app from um, Google Play or the Apple App Stores. And what the 2020 yearbooks show is that with examples such as these, over the last year in particular, biometric payment technologies are creating new opportunities for banks and payment service providers to acquire customers, identify new fraud methods, and help payment players and their merchant partners to deepen customer loyalty. Overall, they're helping to deliver true frictionless payments and customer experiences. Okay, um, so I guess the final bit of interest uh, where I personally have seen, you know, across 2020 reasonably big changes or, or, or what seem to be in some, some people's views seismic changes is, is around digital banking and or digital only banks, uh, which are now sort of fast becoming the first choice for, for, for a number of, uh, I guess, younger or smartphone savvy consumers and are forcing traditional banks to kind of really think about what their strategies are going forward. Um, you know, what does the research show around, uh, around the digital banking movement at the moment? Well, digital banks have a slow start as they, they really had to wait for the technology to catch up to what they wanted to offer. Um, but over 2019 and 2020 in particular, digital banks have proved that they are now catching up to the bricks and mortar rivals and consumers have adopted new technology and channels. Um, according to the Dutch Payments Association, for example, around nine in 10 Dutch bank customers used mobile devices, including smartphones and tablets, or internet banking on desktops and laptops for banking services in 2019. Uh, thanks to the new generation of tech-savvy consumers, the likes of Revolut, Bunk and Tinkoff Bank are acquiring new customers at rates that the traditional physical rivals can only really dream of. 
If you look at the UK, Revolut has now grabbed 12 million customers since its launch in 2015. Um, and it's been able to recruit so many new customers with uh, free bank accounts and agile services like instant money transfers. Revolut now processes over 100 million transactions monthly. Um, in the Netherlands, Bunk has grown from a small IT company with a banking license to now becoming a pan-European player with operations in 30 markets. And its success is starkly illustrated by the fact that user deposits rose by 800% between 2017 and 2018 alone. Over 2019, 10% of all instant payments in the Netherlands were being processed by Bunk. Uh, if you look at Russia, Tinkoff Bank, which is online only, claims to have 10 million customers and a 13.2% market share in credit cards already. Um, Spear Bank, which had a partnership uh, with Yandex, the e-commerce giant, um, has now ended that partnership because it wants to pursue its own standalone digital bank and fintech ambitions. Faced with this competition from the likes of Yandex and others, banks are launching apps adjacent to their own core banking apps, and they're offering services beyond basic banking, as well as new services developed within the core mobile banking apps. In some cases, early bank fintech partnerships are now collapsing as banks look to disrupt digital banks themselves with their own online brands. Super. Vicky, I think um, I want to say thank you very much for, for all the hard work. I know it's an it's a, it's a, it's a enormous product that we build and um, it takes a lot of time and effort to, to, to put it together. So uh, thank you for doing that and thank you for your time today. You've been our bite-sized hero and uh, look forward to speaking to you again about the, uh, about the yearbooks. My pleasure. Thank you very much, Alex.